Can you hear us? If you can hear us, please type something on the chat room on the left. Oh, good. Great. <laughs> something. Can you also see Rob on the screen? Hello, all. Good. So you can see him and you can hear us. Great. So we'll get started in a minute or so, but we just wanted to make sure that the, the sound and the video is working. So if you just uh, give us one minute so we can wait for the rest of the, the participants, that would be great. So now I'm stuck so trying to figure out what to do. So I should smile or frown, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you coming? Where are you joining us from? Florida, some people from Florida, Nebraska, Georgia, California. Wow, everywhere. That's great. Washington. Oh, there's Dahlia. <laughs> Virginia. Welcome, everyone. All right, well, we'll, we'll get started since uh, it's already time for us to, to do so. So welcome, National Geographic Learning instructors. Thank you so much for joining us today at this National Geographic Learning webinar and standout evidence-based instruction for college and career readiness featuring Rob Jenkins. This webinar is for those of you who are interested in learning about Rob Jenkins' adult series, Stand Out, and how this series will help you to prepare for your, um, prepare your students for college and career readiness as well as workplace. My name is Dalia Bravo and I'm the Product Marketing Manager for the U.S. I'm so sorry you can't see me, I'm having a bad hair day. <laughs> so, but today I'll be facilitating and supporting Rob during this webinar. Uh, so before we start our session, as you notice, uh, Rob will not be able to hear you, uh, but the good news is that um, you can interact with us during the, um, on the chatting room, and we are also going to dedicate time at the end of the webinar for, for taking some questions from you. So let's get started, shall we? Um, allow me to introduce Rob Jenkins. He is a professor of ESL and the faculty development coordinator, serving over 300 instructors teaching for the Santa Ana College School of Continuing Education in California. He's also a recipient of the Santa Ana College Distinguished Faculty Award. Rob is also the uh, textbook author and consultant for National Geographic Learning. He's the author of Stand Out and series editor for World English and also consults on state and national projects. Rob, uh, as well as his co-author Stacy Johnson, um, were awarded for the Highly Outstanding Achievement Award for the contribution to publishing in 2013. So without further ado, please help me welcome Rob Jenkins. Rob? Thank you, Dahlia. I appreciate it. I'm excited about this webinar. I hope that this uh, works out well for everybody. Um, uh, as Dahlia said, I am a teacher. I am a college professor, but uh, teach a continuing education, which is similar to adult education, and that we have, well, in our school, we have um, about 20,000 uh, uh, students every year uh, for ESL alone. And uh, we work through um, lots of issues. You know, a lot of our students have, um, they have, uh, literacy issues, uh, they may not have a lot of experience in their country, but then again we have some that um, have doctorates. So we have, as you know, a multi-level class just like you do, and uh, it's exciting to uh, look for products and look for strategies that will help them. Um, I am a teacher first before I'm an author, that's the most important thing to me, and I enjoy teaching a lot. I use book two of Standout in my class currently, and uh, I 
have tested all of the materials, and I'm very excited about them and know that they work. Uh, but you are the expert for your class. You are the ones that um, know your students the best. Uh, so I would really stress that you would spend some time thinking about your students. Anytime you have someone giving a presentation like this and talking about um, instruction, uh, you always want to apply that to your students and not just blindly follow. So I would encourage you to think about these principles as we talk about it. They're very important to me, but you may adapt as you, as you see the need to. Um, because every class is different. There's no perfect book. There's no perfect strategy because every student is different. And from semester to semester, students change. So that's really important. We'll be talking today about, uh, we'll be talking today about uh, Standout. We'll be using, I'll be using some examples from Standout. Standout is a six level series. Many of you, I understand, are using the book right now. So hopefully we'll be able to give you some instruction. I will be able to give you some help with some of the strategies. The most important thing is that you understand where we're coming from as we produce the materials so that you can exploit the ideas that we are promoting and you want to do that. Standout's a six level series. It starts at the very lowest level, so we call that basic and it goes to the advanced level. We call that book five. Um, you will see um, lots of images and beautiful pictures from National Geographic, which is a great addition to our third edition. Um, so in the third edition, we see some wonderful changes and we see some um, emphasis on new things as we promote um, college and career readiness standards. Although a lot of it was already in Standout, we are making it clearer so that you can see it better and know and understand how this all works together. Um, in the, the new um, title for Standout is Standout Evidence-Based Instruction for College and Career Readiness Standards. Evidence-based instruction means instruction that is, um, has been tested, uh, ideas that have been tried. We call them in the lesson planner, which we'll talk about later, uh, we call it uh, best practices uh, so that you might see through um, these ideas um, how, um, how you might be able to employ some strategies. So if you don't have a lesson planner, um, eventually you want to get one because that will help you a lot to understand how to best use the materials. And of course, your creativity and your ideas are always encouraged. One of the greatest things that you will see in Standout, and I think is probably the most important thing that I can talk about today, is the um, effort to have critical thinking throughout. Critical thinking allows students to um, think, not only as they think critically, they're more engaged, they will remember more, they will be more prepared for the workplace and the academic areas so that they, they can excel more. And most importantly, they will become independent lifelong learners. Um, when I talk about independent lifelong learners, what I'm really saying is that our students will be able to learn how to learn. They'll be able to go into the classroom, into a college credit classroom, or go into a uh, into the workplace, and they'll be able to figure things out and work through those things. So we really want to spend some time talking about those. Um, so today, what I'd like to do is basically work with the, the philosophy. And we're going to be talking about the philosophy a lot because I feel like if you understand our philosophy, you will understand what we're trying to accomplish and it will make it easier for you to teach. Um, so that's very, very important uh, that you understand that philosophy. We do have um, a place where you can read about the philosophy in detail. And that's independent of uh, National Geographic at esl-teacher.net. You see it at the bottom of the slide there. You can go there and pull that up. I wouldn't do it now, but you can go there and pull that up and read our philosophy statement, the history of how we developed the curriculum, et cetera. And you can find that out there. Um, the other thing that is really important today in adult education, and what we talked a lot about, um, is are all these standards. We've talked about standards in adult education for a long time. Uh, we had SCANS, for example, and EFF, Equipped for the Future. These standards have been around and they still are valuable and important. But as we see new standards coming out, we have new requirements from WIOA. We have college and career readiness standards. There's something new that many of you may not have heard of yet, but important you want to look that up is English language proficiency standards. Those things you really want to look at 
um, and, and to understand. But don't get overwhelmed. This is one of the difficulties with us as teachers. We can get overwhelmed with all of these things. Oh, now I'm supposed to employ this. Now I'm supposed to do that. I have to understand all of these things, and it gets overwhelming. But all of these things have something in common. Uh, the new standards all have something in common. And that something is critical thinking. So my goal today is to help you to see that when you incorporate critical thinking effectively in the classroom, what you will be doing is you will be meeting the college and career readiness standards. You will be meeting the English language proficiency standards. You will be preparing your students for the workplace. So you will be meeting the WIOA requirements. These are the things that we, you know, we shouldn't trust a book to do that for it, for us. We need to understand where all of this is coming from. Um, we do have correlations in the books. We, in our lesson planner, you can see all the correlations with college and career readiness standards, English professions, proficiency standards. But rest assured, and CASAS and other things, but rest assured that all of these things are incorporated into the book. Um, and when you understand where what the basis for all of these things are, which is critical thinking, you will see it transparently as you turn from page to page and you work from activity to activity. So um, finally, I want to spend a bit of time, quite a bit of time, talking about the different resources you have. Uh, you know, we, we look at the textbook, but there's more than just the textbook. Um, the textbook is important because it, it helps us to move forward and to decide what we're going to do in the class, when we're going to do it. But um, we have other materials that will help you to also supplement and to strengthen that. And I said there was no perfect book, but you have an opportunity to make changes in some of these materials so that you can make it exactly what you need specifically for your students. And I'm talking there about our, our online worksheets. We have over 2,000. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But those are all customizable. You can put student names in and all sorts of things. So there's a lot that can be done. We have online an online workbook, which is uh, different than the, the student workbook. And um, that also is a great addition. So we'll be talking about these as we go along. There's quite a few resources. Don't want to give you so many that you're confused. So we're going to walk you through these. And I'll show you how I might do it in the classroom and how I use these products a little bit so that you'll understand it better. Okay, so the first question is we have to ask ourselves, what in the world is this critical thinking? Uh, um, one of the things that comes to mind often is that my students, or not my students, certain people have come to me with, who have not come to my critical, work, critical thinking workshops, and they have, um, they have said, well, you know what, you really can't do critical thinking at the lowest levels. And I know that's not true, and I think that most of you know that's not true, but I want to stress it here. You can do critical thinking at the lowest levels. Some of it you might want to categorize as preparatory critical thinking. If you think about the Bloom's taxonomy, for, uh, for example, you might say that um, identify would not be critical thinking. But um, you, you do have students, they can do many different things to help them in um, critical thinking. The reason I have this picture up here is to show you that animals can think critically. So we know that these kind of things can, uh, can be done by our students. They're adults. They have the opportunities. They've had experience using critical thinking to make decisions in their lives. So just because they don't have a language does not mean that they can't do critical thinking. They can. Uh, nurturing our students is not giving them everything. We, we are good instructors when we nurture their creativity critical thinking skills and independence, ultimately leading them to become independent, lifelong learners. That's our goal, to help them be independent, lifelong learners. I'm going to be using the word creativity and critical thinking interchangeably. They're not exactly the same, but both of them have um, some cognitive um, value that is beyond just um, superficial information. So uh, we'll be talking about it. At a, at a, that as we go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. We can have big, giant, incredible definitions of what critical thinking is. We know about Bloom's taxonomy. And there's another one called TABA. TABA is just like Bloom's taxonomy, except she adds feeling. She says if you add feeling, 
to your instruction, the students will remember more, and it's a good um, a good thing to add. We now have in this new era, we have what's called Web's depth of knowledge. All of these things we can memorize, we could try to quantify, we could try to put in the classroom in lots of different ways. Um, here, I can, for example, give you a, I can quote you a definition. Uh, Michael Scriven and uh, Richard Paul in 1987 gave this definition. Critical thinking is the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reasoning, or communication as a guide to belief and action. Wow, that's a mouthful. If we're in the classroom and we are trying to determine whether or not our students are actively involved, if they are engaged, if they are engaged in critical thinking, we can't spit off that definition in our brain. We're going to forget about it. So what I suggest we do is make a guiding principle. So I'm going to ask you now to all write a guiding principle. And uh, we'll just read a couple of them. Um, I'd like you to type this. It should be one sentence. It cannot have more than one and in it, because I don't want something long and crazy. Um, and it should, let's say, only two, two commas total. So um, if you can. Give us your definition, not definition, a guiding principle. Start with this. I'll give you a prompt to help you do this. Um, so say any task that. So you're a teacher and you're trying to determine whether or not you have critical thinking going on. Say any task that and uh, add to that. Anybody like to try that out? Go ahead and type any task that does so and so, something or other. All right. I always say in class, pa, pa, pa. See what you come up with. Any task that involves students finding answers that I don't already that they don't already know. Okay, that's great, Emily. Um, any others? Any task that causes the student to turn knowledge into application. I love it. Any task that requires common sense. Good. And that's all in caps. <laughs> can it can be applied to the real world. Critical thinking means adding all your knowledge to create the best solution for the current situation. These are all great. Any task that challenges thinking and excites creativity, wonderful. Any task that involves thought and discussion, all right. Any task that brings real world experience into the classroom. These are all great answers. I'm going to give you mine. Um, you might want to write it down or look at it later, but it doesn't have to be mine. But this is our philosophy, so you'll understand where we're coming from when we talk about critical thinking. So here's ours. Tasks that require learners to think deeper than the superficial vocabulary and meaning. So they go beyond, they give more value to, to what they see or hear. They go beyond that from the superficial to a deeper meaning. So let me um, give you a couple examples so you can see what I mean. So we may be talking about clothing and uh, we ask the students at a low level to categorize that clothing in cold weather clothing and warm weather clothing. We might ask them to put uh, fruits and vegetables in the different categories. So categorizing or classifying is critical thinking because they have to give additional value to those words. So you see sandals. Well, I know what a sandal is. I can show a picture of sandals and um, our students can see that. Or I can say, hey, you know what? Tell me, how do you use this sandal? So the superficial is a picture. Superficial might be just a translation if you want to go that way. I don't prefer that, but uh, you can do that. Um, or you can start giving it more value by classifying. That's one example. In a paragraph at a higher level, for example, you might ask the students to infer. In Standout, we have lots of these um, activities uh, in our reading challenge, which we'll talk a little bit more about in every unit. There's a reading challenge. Um, which is intended to be a challenge. It's intended to be difficult. It's intended to be um, to help the students really work through it. Uh, college and career readiness standards demands uh, complexity. This is an opportunity to do that. Um, and the students here. Well, I'll give you an example. If I were to give, if I were to write a paragraph and I say um, John and Judy live in Canada, they um, have a wonderful family. They have three kids and they have six dogs and four cats. Um, I could ask you questions about that paragraph. I could ask you about their 
superficial things. Where are they from? Canada. Uh, uh, do they have a wonderful family? Yes. <laughs> okay, but I could ask, do they like animals? And then you have to infer. You have to find more information. You have to figure out what it means. That's critical thinking. So in this particular activity, students are reading paragraphs, and they have to, they take, um, we give them some information about each paragraph, but we don't tell them which it is. Is it paragraph one or two? And they have to figure out, based on what's written, what the category is or what the paragraph is about. This is a precursor to writing clear paragraphs with one idea, with a topic sentence and a conclusion. But at this point, they're just trying to figure out what that paragraph is about. Realizing that paragraphs have that each have main ideas is, is critical thinking. So let's just do a quick activity. Now, we're not going to take the time to really do this activity, but um, we'll do a little bit of it. If I, this is from book two. This is uh, the second um, presentation practice of, we have three presentations and practices for every lesson. This is in the fourth lesson, and this is the second practice. And uh, what we ask students to do after they've given some information about um, healthy diets, we ask them to take this information, and we're going to ask them about nutrition. But first, I want to reemphasize the vocabulary and teach them some more vocabulary. What we do in Standout is not like some other books that have um, vocabulary all up, fr up front or all in one lesson. Um, we know that students can only learn a set amount of vocabulary at a time. So we introduce, and the higher levels, they can do a little bit more than the lower levels. The lower levels may be only six words a lesson. The higher levels may be 20 words, but they can only learn a little bit at a time. So superficially, I could say, uh, what does Sylvie eat for breakfast? You don't need to respond, but you know cereal and milk. What does Rosa eat for breakfast? Toast and coffee. Now I can begin to ask questions that are deeper and that um, um, involve critical thinking. For example, um, uh, who has the better nutrition for breakfast, Sylvia or Rosa? And uh, you might, let's say that you chose Sylvia, right? So that's a little bit deeper. Uh, you might, I might ask, um, why do you think Sylvia has better nutrition? You may say, Coffee isn't nutritious, or some people may say that toast is not, uh, you know, if it's white toast, or they may be talking about what kind of toast. Is it wheat, or white, or rye, or what it is? So those are things that you can ask the students. You can go from superficial to critical thinking. Now, the activity in the book is even more involved than that. Take all of their meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner for all five of these people, all right? Look at them and decide who has the best nutrition for all three meals together, all right? So why don't you respond? Um, you, ordinarily, we do this in groups, but as, a t as um, individuals, why don't you just look quickly and say who you think has the best nutritious, nutrition. Emily says Rosa. Martina says Fernando. Uh, we have more Rosas, more Rosas. It's interesting, when I do this, often people say um, Rosa has the best nutrition, but when I do it in the classroom, we have every kind of answer. And you know the greatest thing about this type of critical thinking activity, the greatest part is that students can't be wrong. So all the students are communicating. This is another great benefit of critical thinking. It's true communication. This goes beyond just um, repeating dialogues and all that kind of thing. We're actually having students communicate. Will they make mistakes? Will they have problems with their communication? Will they be using their hands a lot? Absolutely. But that's natural. That's real life. This is true communication. So I'm seeing Sylvia and Agustin and Fernando. We have lots of different answers. That's, that's good because everybody can be right. Um, and, and, and we hope that you'll be able to defend that. And in fact, what we ask the students to do in, in this particular activity is we ask them to do this in a team and come to consensus. Another great opportunity to use critical thinking. Here, they have to defend why they think so. Um, maybe somebody in the group um, 
is lact uh, lactose intolerant, and they say, well, you know, Sylvia can't be good because she drinks milk, and as far as I'm concerned, milk isn't healthy. Or maybe we have some ve uh, vegetarians in the group or vegans in the group. Um, there's all sorts of different reasons why one might be better than the other. And you need to defend that in your team, in your group. This is a beginning high activity. And in beginning high, just as in the other levels, um, students are um, using critical thinking and they're engaged. They are really, truly engaged. This is not something superficial. This is very good. Um, yes, uh, I see that some of you are saying beer is very healthy. <laughs> uh, that, that's debatable. All right, so we, we kind of have the idea here. So in standout, here are a, a, some examples of critical thinking. We have a lot of others, but you'll see lots of graphs and charts. You'll see uh, analyzing data. You'll see classifying, a lot of classifying. That's an easy one to do. And even if it's not in the book and you want to do it, you can do it because that is a great opportunity to um, really stress and really push critical thinking. Again, going beyond the superficial meaning, going beyond giving more value to something. When we rank, for example, as we just did, when we rank, we are giving more value to the superficial. Uh, collaborating over a problem. Here's a problem. What are you going to do about it? often ask students questions. Even at the lowest levels, you can ask students questions. What's the difference between a, bar, a bottle and a jar? Um, there's all sorts of things you can do. You can have them collaborating and talking. True communication comes from critical thinking. You can have them define concepts. You can have them comparing Venn diagrams. Johari squares is uh, similar to a Venn diagram and charts. You can have them evaluating and use rubrics. Rubrics are great. They're going to need rubrics in the higher levels. They're going to use rubrics in uh, credit classes, ESL classes, in their composition classes. They're going to see rubrics. They need to know how to do that. Um, predicting, ranking, reaching consensus, summarizing concepts, all of these things can help uh, you do that. Um, I see a question here. It says, can you please show Rob's definition of critical thinking? So. Um, there is a long definition, but my definition, I'll just go back and show you so you can see it real quick. Since I happened to catch you writing that, there's a lot to read, but I've just read it every once in a while. Tasks that require learners to think deeper than the superficial vocabulary meeting. Again, this isn't a full definition. This is a guiding principle. Uh, that long definition that I read, you can find in my documents on esl-teacher.net. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's get to why, why critical thinking. Why is it important? And I've already mentioned that students are engaged, students are involved, they'll remember more, they're using true communication. But what is so great about, remember, college and career readiness, what's so great about critical thinking is that it ensures academic success and workplace success. Those activities are the same. The workplace and academic require the same kind of cognitive work, which is exciting because now you don't have to split yourself between two different people and say, oh, now we're going to teach some workplace stuff, and now we're going to teach some academic stuff, and now we can, you don't have to go back and forth. You got it. You're there. So. Um, Think about that as we go through. So let's just take let's just take the first one here. Let's talk about college and career readiness. For those of you that are not familiar with college and career readiness, that those are standards that are now becoming super important. They came from the Common Core, but it's for adult education, and all the um, adult education materials are requiring those things right now. If you want to read the full definition and explanation, there's a booklet, a book, basically. I think it's 89 pages. Um, search on Google for Susan P. Mintel, P-I-M-E-N-T-A-L, and uh, pull up her um, explanation and her grid to what college and career readiness standards are. When we wrote Standout, we had to do a, a correlation to college and career readiness standards. 
Um, and to make it easier for us, I abbreviated them. I brought them down into a super abbreviated form. That takes um, a little bit of um, interpretation. So I would suggest you don't use these. Well, I would suggest you use these, but that you don't call them college and career readiness standards because they are it, it's fairly incomplete because college and career readiness standards have different columns. But if you were to if you were to um, if you were to summarize what they are, here are some examples. So let let's try something for me. Um, if you were to consider these college and career readiness standards, would you look at these for a minute? Which ones would you say involve critical thinking? All right, so go ahead and write now, just for a moment, go ahead and write which ones, which ones do you think are critical thinking? Oh, the very first one said all. What a great answer. Okay, reading, all. Yeah, a lot of you guys are already on the bandwagon. Good job, all right. Um, you see analyzing, interpreting, you see reading, um, comparing. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you see. So again, here is the secret to using our materials. Here is the secret to not being overwhelmed with college and career readiness standards and all the other things. When you use critical thinking, you are meeting college and career readiness standards. Life is easy. Life is wonderful. Um, we, have, we have correlated them. We have pulled out a lot of information to make sure that we're hitting all of these areas. But you can, be, you can feel comfortable as long as you exploit that critical thinking. Make sure you don't skim over those activities that have critical thinking in them. You will see that. And you will understand what I'm talking about in just a moment as we talk, as we go through a unit. And we'll do that in just two or, two or three minutes. Um, on the other side, so we have college. That's especially you think about academic. But on the other side, on the workplace, um, we introduce in Standout, we have all of these different areas. Combine ideas and information. Make decisions. Exercise leadership roles. Manage time. Complete tasks as assigned. Interact appropriate with team members. Collect and gather information. Interpret and communicate information. Apply technology. All of these things, too, involve critical thinking. And students are engaged. These things you can do in both academic. You have to make decisions in a, in a college classroom? Absolutely. Do you have to exert leadership roles? Well, the most successful students do. Do you have to complete tasks as assigned? Absolutely. Do you have to manage your time? Absolutely. Apply technology. 21st century skills is another standard. Uh, we need to make sure our students are applying technology. Um, just a caveat here that uh, I like to talk about because people don't know this. A lot of you know about our activity worksheets, our 2000 activity worksheet. But many of you don't know that we have many worksheets for every level. They go through every unit on how to use the internet in the classroom and how to bring um, real life experience, uh, uh, real life things into the classroom, whether it's forms or it's uh, um, um, shopping, for example. You can shop online for, at the supermarket, for example, whether it's reading materials, whatever it is. We have this opportunity. We also have digital literacy. We have. Uh, worksheets that show you how to students can go into the classroom and cut and paste and they can um, use Word and Excel. We have them doing those type of things as well. So you can integrate it. It's not separate. It's integrated into the instruction. So if you don't know about that, that's a great place to go to those worksheets to in encourage your students to do more and to really apply uh, technology. So that's exciting. So how do we actually do the workplace connection? One of the things we do is in the lesson planner. It's not in the, we, we're very careful to keep our pages clean and beautiful. So we don't have a massive number of icons. Uh, but in the lesson planner, you will see at the top of the pages, it will say 
Uh, exercise C combines ideas and information, and it'll be your workplace connection. So we have explanations about that annotated in the lesson planner. Another place where students are using critical thinking to the max and applying principles that they would use at home, at work, and in school is our projects. Now, the project-based learning. Project-based learning is absolutely probably the most spoken about when you talk about evidence-based instruction. Project-based learning is probably the number one thing that you read. So um, this, these activities are important. Some people say, oh man, they're sometimes two days and I don't have time to put in two days. Well, I personally, when I use my books and I'm using them now, I do every other one. But they're great because they're an application for the unit. All the information that the students have learned through the semester or through the unit, they are applying in these true, close to real life act simulations, as we'll call them, um, where they work as a team, they produce a product, they share the product with the class in a presentation. Wonderful activities. And in the lesson planner, we will walk you through how to do this. It's not complicated. And what the students accomplish are exciting. Um, I have a lot of examples. Uh, and uh, again, you're welcome to come to my class anytime you like. So if you happen to be close to Disneyland and you want to come and visit me, just email me, shoot me an email, and come on by and observe my class. I would love it. I would love any visits. Um, so um, think about that, too. It's, it, it would be great to you, you could see some of the projects that the students have done. And maybe you'll show up on a day that uh, I'm actually doing the project. They're very productive. And students are using true and real communication while collaborating, while making decisions, doing all of those things that we talked about earlier. So um, don't forget that um, as we move forward. Here are some examples of some of those team projects. So um, in the book, you can see book basic, book one, two, three, four, and five. You will see the different activities um, that students do from creating a city brochure to doing a health presentation to um, solving a company problem to making a handbook. At the lower level, they plan a you know, department store, or create a restaurant, plan a dream home. All sorts of things they do, but they do it in collaborative teams of, of three to five students. So again, that's exciting. Now, I think you've got the idea about our philosophy. We have 25 minutes to talk a little bit about what happens in the books. Um, I want to give you a little bit of time for questions at the end. So we'll work on that. But in the meantime, um, let me show you a few things that maybe will answer some of those questions as we go through. Um, I want you to know about all the resources involved. You don't have to use any of the resources. You can use the student book, and that's all, and that's fine. Although I would encourage you to get a lesson planner, because the lesson planner will truly inform you about all the things that you can do. And then if you have more problems, I'm accessible. Robjenkins.esl at uh, gmail.com. Um, I have other emails, but that one will work just fine. And that's uh, on my last slide. So if you need it, um, Dahlia can give it to you as well. And, uh, or you can come back and look at the last slide on the webinar um, if you want to look at it at another time. So one of the great tools that we have and that I use in the classroom is called the presentation tool. The presentation tool has every page in the book. And you can go through them and uh, work with the students. If you happen to have a projection unit, um, you can use it if you have a projection unit, if you have a smart board or other interactive whiteboard, you can do that as well. And they're great. So let's, let's just, I want to show you a, a lesson real quickly. So let's go ahead and do, uh, I'll click on, if I were to click on unit three, this is what I would get. And now I can go to the workbook or I can go to the lessons. Okay, and in this case, I'm going to go to lesson four. So here's the book page. You can see on this book page, you can see on this book page that there's a place to click on the audio. So you don't have to put in a CD. You can get the audio on a CD if you need to. You can have it here on this presentation tool. Or you can get it online. 
and students can get it online, and students can listen on their own online. You can have it on your phone. You can have it anywhere you want, and you can listen to the audio. So this is a, a great advantage. Um, we're going to notice a couple other things. Um, there's some mention of some of the information on the lesson planner. But one of the things I want to highlight right now is you see this big red. See, this one doesn't have any red. And then this one has interpret. This one has classify. What do you think that is? Anybody have a, a thought I'd like to type that in? What are those big? Why is it red and bold? They're not links. No, but that's good. They'd be nice. Critical thinking. I like to say that it's critical thinking and college and career readiness combined. That's really what we're doing. We're connecting critical thinking and we're connecting uh, college and career readiness standards. So this is, so we are trying to be transparent. So we say, hey, really exploit the critical thinking here. Really use it as you see the classifying. All right, so you understand our philosophy that you could see that. That's wonderful. Um, every lesson has an objective. This one happens to be identify healthy foods. So we're asking the students to identify healthy foods. By the end of class, students will be able to identify um, healthy foods. Um, there's a question real quickly, a uh, presentation tool on how do you access it. We have um, flash drives for you. And you just plug in those flash drives and, for each level. And then you can use it. Um, and it works. It works great. Um, I love I love using it because it makes life easier. There's lots of different tools. I won't go over them now, but there's tools for writing. There's tools for shading, um, for for hiding um, different pieces of information. If you double click, it expands the view. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do there. So that's good. There's also games in here. This page doesn't have a game, but there's also games like tic tac toe and different things like that. Um, okay, so we have our goal. Our goal is identify healthy foods. I want you to notice here that we have this reading. This is high beginning, um, and the reading in, in the reading challenge will be much more difficult. But it's in high beginning that we really start having these informational paragraphs. This is a paragraph about nutrition. So it's becoming more and more ac academic. So um, as you go, you might be looking at those things and uh, seeing the progression. We have a progression of reading, from reading uh, articles or paragraphs about uh, basic information, like about something fictitious. And then we have things that are more informational. And that's in book two is where we start hitting that. And you'll see in every unit more and more reading. Again, everything is integrated. There's a reason for that. We don't have special lessons for pronunciation and special lessons for writing and special lessons for this and that. All the skills are integrated. We do have that special activity for reading that is um, adding the complexity. But other than that, we don't. We have five lessons in the book. Each lesson is um, integrated, has integrated skills. Every lesson has grammar in it. Every lesson has listening in it. Every lesson has speaking in it. Most lessons have writing and uh, reading in it. So we have those integrated skills all the way through. When I go to the next page of this lesson, you'll see the one activity we did. This is the full activity with the ranking and students working in teams to do that. And ranking is critical thinking. You'll see a Venn diagram. Um, you'll have, you have these little buttons on the side that you can push. These buttons are so that you can play a game or something like that. But we'll have Venn diagrams. You know, I've, I'm always surprised when students don't know how to do a Venn diagram. It's great to teach this and make sure they know it. We have these best practices explained in the lesson planner about making sure that students understand and use these kind of um, figures and ideas. So keep those things in mind as we go through. So that is an example of a lesson. One of the things I want to show you very quickly in this lesson, oops, can't click on that, can I? Um, if I go backwards, um, I want to show you that every lesson has three presentations and three practices. So here's a presentation and a practice. Here's a presentation and a practice. Here's a presentation and a practice and an application. So every, we follow a lesson plan format. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But I wanted you to be able to see that 
and it's usually pretty transparent that you can see that, but if you follow the lesson planner, that will help you that much more. Um, so um, look, I look forward to you trying those things. I hope you look forward to trying those things out and thinking in these terms. My students know a lesson plan format because I tell them. I'm extremely transparent how I do it. So they know when we're in the presentation stage. They know when they're in the practice stage. They know when we're in the application stage. So that's some examples. Now, I, let's say that I just taught this lesson. Um, I want the students to learn. And what happens is we need to recycle information. So I may have given them, at the beginning of the unit, I may have given them a little test. We have what's called exam view. I can give them a test on just this, this unit if I wanted to. And exam view will allow you can pick and choose or change anything you'd like and do that. Then I teach, then they, they may have forgotten what they learned from that test. Then I, I may, I will teach this lesson. So they learn it again. Then I tell them, you may forget. That's okay. You can forget. Because, and this is part of learning. But then I give them some homework. Yes, students can do homework. Yes, you should give students homework if they have their own books. Yes, yes, yes. This is academic preparation. Homework is important. So if you can do it, and there's plenty of strategies to help students to do that. I have all my students that do the homework stand up every day. Um, I don't degrade those that don't do their homework. I just encourage those that do to stand up. And after a few days, everybody is standing up because they don't want to be sitting down anymore. So they do the homework. And I can keep track of who's doing it that way, too. Um, so um, you can, but there's a workbook. Many of you are familiar with Grammar Challenge. Grammar Challenge is was wonderful. People loved Grammar Challenge. It introduced the topic. It had a chart. After the chart, there was uh, mechanical practice and meaningful practice and communicative practice. Well, now we have a workbook that includes Grammar Challenge, but also more reading, writing, and uh, more, more reading and writing and uh, additional grammar. So I can go back to my uh, presentation tool and I can click on workbook. And I will get a workbook page. This happens to be lesson five, not lesson four. But um, you can see, and every workbook page has there's every workbook lesson has three pages, just like the student book, and they directly relate. I'm sorry, I clicked on the five instead of four, but they directly relate. So you have reading, and all the way through till you get to the last page, or just before the last page, you'll have your grammar chart that was in grammar challenge, and then you'll have um, a full page of grammar exercises that go from meaning, that mechanical to meaningful. So yes, yes, this is all um, helpful because the students have learned, forgot, learned, forgot, learned, and now you're going to review it. Uh, learn, forgot as they did the homework. Then you're going to review it in the classroom and they learn it again. And then you're going to do a project. They're going to forget it. Then you're going to do well. You do review. Then they forget it again. Then you're going to do a project and they forget it again. How many times can we recycle? We can recycle a lot, and it's interesting. It's not boring as the students do that. If that is not enough, if you still need more, and again, you are the experts for your class, so I don't want you to forget that. You, we have 2,000 in the neighborhood of 2,000 multi-level customizable worksheets. Um, they have grammar practice, reading and writing practice, even listening practice are in there. And those are available, you can see on the slide, those are available through ngl.cengage.com slash standout3. The, um, you'll need to go to the teacher page. And you'll, you have to search a little bit to find it. Once you find it, you're in good shape. So one, you just need to find it the first time. The username is standout, and the password is teacher. So more than you should definitely look at these and see. They are at multi-level, which means that this happens to be a B. But there's A, B, and C versions of the same worksheet. So if you feel like you need something a little lower or you want to give some students some and some students others, you can do that. This will help you if you're teaching a multi-level class as well that's designated multi-level. Um, if, uh, if you want, I have a booklet. I teach a lot. I, I've done a lot of workshops on multi-level instruction. And I have a booklet that I put together to give you an introduction to how to teach multi-level. And uh, basically what I talk about in the booklet is that you just tweak what you already know into something a little bit broader um, with um, different objectives, with, with various objectives that are just added.
adding to themselves. And uh, so if you want to look at that, again, you can go to our independent site that's not National Geographic, esl-teacher.net for that booklet, and uh, you'll have it. So think about that. If you want to read more about that, you can go to that site, click on multi-level or multi-level worksheet or workshops. Um, we do, uh, basically that site is just a bunch of um, workshops and our handouts. So you can go there anytime you're welcome to do that. Um, what's nice, again, about National Geographic, they have entered the scene in our third edition, and we are able to take advantage of some great things that they offer. For example, now we have an opening page, an opening page in every unit that's a two-sided spread um, that, um, that have beautiful pictures that introduce and prepare our students for the topic. Uh, we give you all the information in the lesson planner about what to do with these pictures and how to do it. We talk about your outcomes, your student learning outcomes that the students will be able to do. That's here. Those are your objectives. We give you some suggestions on what to do here, but we give you additional uh, instructions. We give you a, we give you all the correlations in the lesson planner for this. We talk about the workplace connection. We talk about all the different things um, that you could use to exploit these wonderful and beautiful images that uh, we have from National Geographic. Something else from National Geographic, at the end of every unit, we have a special two-page spread that's reading challenge. This one comes from um, the, uh, book, the very first book, Basic. And it looks pretty difficult for that level, and it is. I'm not going to argue with you, it is definitely um, difficult. That's good. Uh, one of our principles, one of the philosophies that we follow very strongly is that reading should be slightly higher than the level because then they can incorporate strategies. If you put reading at the same level, they're not going to be able to incorporate strategies. They don't need to. They can read it, no problem. Same with listening. Listening should be more difficult than they actually can understand 100% of because they need to practice strategies. We'll help you with those strategies. We teach you those strategies in the lesson planner. So um, be aware of that. You can see here we've got a lot of critical thinking in these activities. Um, I've been using book two, which is much more extensive than this. The earlier one we looked at with the three paragraphs was book two, high beginning. And, um, they work, and I've done them in the class. I was a little worried, too, that they're a little high. But I walk through it with the students, and they can do it. Guaranteed. It's, it's a wonderful thing. We, and what's nice is these are um, true stories about real people who are National Geographic explorers. What's great about that, and we're going to talk about video in a minute, but what's great about that is most of these guys have video. So if you want to show a video afterwards online, you can do it. And that's just one extra thing that's wonderful about it. That's totally natural and difficult. Sometimes the, um, the instructions are difficult. But uh, I did a rock climber the other day. It's not Jimmy Chin. But a, a rock climber the other day in book two. And uh, this rock climber climbs with no ropes. And he fell and uh, broke his neck and his back and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, what's great about it is that the video has almost, the video that he did, or that National Geographic did, has very little talking on it at all. And it's super, it very much supported what the article that, that the students read was about. Because it showed him on his way to recovery and starting to climb again. It was wonderful. And very little talking in that one. So it was ideal for this type of thing. So again, you have a lot of resources in Beyond Standout that you can use to be able to do this. Another example um, of, of things that National Geographic has added and things we've had. Well, we've had the video before, the life scale video. Now this is incorporated into the book. So the life scale video is in the book, accessible from a DVD or accessible online. Um, again, you can get these, you can show them in the class or accessible on the presentation tool. So you can just click on the presentation tool and you've got it. So uh, you have that great value as well. Then you have uh, 
there's a National Geographic video after Unit 4 and after Unit 8. Those have narration that is that level or slightly above. Those you have a four-page um, activity in the book itself that uh, students will prepare and then watch and then um, speak to it afterwards. So you have all of that kind of, all of those things uh, are available to you. The videos are National Geographic, but the narration is our own narration to meet the level of the students. So um, the, I, I love the, um, the one on the left, the uh, survival or the uh, life skill videos, uh, because there's one for every unit. But what's nice is it's all natural language because we believe in authentic language and, and when, we're, when we're learning. So there's actually videos for every level and you have access to all of them. And so you could use the one for, let's say, clothing or shopping. You could use the one from book one, two, three, four, or um, five. You could use any of those videos for your, your lesson if you'd like to. So that's just one more great value. So how do you do all of this? How do you organize it all? How do you get it all together? How do you make it all work? We give you the lesson planner. The lesson planner is ideal because it has instructions that help you. We have something called best practices. This, this particular slide doesn't show it, but it talks about our philosophy all the way through. We walk you through a lesson plan. The lesson plans are, are paced. We use the WIPIA model. This is the WIPIA model. We use the WIPIA model to go through step by step how to um, use the materials, the WIPIA model warm up, introduction, presentation, practice, evaluation, and application. Um, the students are able to follow because there's a progression. We also give you in this, we give you in this lesson planner, we give you an agenda if you'd like to use it. Of course, you don't have to. You don't have to follow these things exactly. The listening script is in the text. It's not in the back of the book. It's in the text. So if you, you don't need the student book, the student book's part of the lesson planner. A lesson planner is different than a student book or a, a teacher's guide because not only does it tell you what to do with activities on the page, it helps you to know what to do uh, with the class from beginning of the class to the end of the class. A lot of the suggestions are when the books are closed because it's not about the book as much as it's about your class and your learners. Um, we give you places to write information. So if you think that um, we've made a mistake or we think, or you think that there's a better way to do it, you just take an annotation and put that in your book and you can make that work for you. So again, um, there's, I can do a whole workshop on lesson planning by itself, but um, you'll get the idea of this lesson plan format and follow, if you follow it, your students will understand the progression and they'll move from what they already know to knowing much more and uh, applying it at the end, which means that you are checking to see if students are, have learned it and are able to do it. Your goal by the end of class, students will be able to read a classified ad. And you are checking that in the application and the students know if they've been able to do it too. So you can tell yourself, was my students able to do it? Finally, last thing, the, uh, last resource for you. You can purchase additionally, and this you'll know, talk to Dahlia about or your rep, but you can purchase additionally online workbooks. They are not the written workbooks. This is something completely different. So if you want to encourage digital literacy and you want your students to learn how to work online, they have an opportunity online to go and do all sorts of activities from, you know, dr drag and drop to uh, watching a video and answering questions. There, all of these things supplement the lesson by lesson, everything that's in the book. So if I did unit four, less, unit three, lesson four, and then I can go on to the online workbook and I can use it. So these are the kind of things that you can do. You can um, choose to not manage the student's work or you can manage it. And if you manage it, you'll, you'll be able to see what they've done and what they've accomplished. Uh, that's what I have here in the front here. They, you, can, you can follow up and see, oh, this person did 50% of the work and this person finished this and finished the other. And you can follow it. 
you can use this. Um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. I'll say that. I don't want to quote a price because I don't know what it is for sure, but it's relatively inexpensive. Students can purchase it. Uh, your school can purchase it. There's lots of different ways to go about it. And you can have access to it for free. So we'll uh, make sure you talk to your rep or to uh, uh, Dahlia about that. And that will, you know, you can move forward with that. The, uh, uh, so just in review, we have many components. The presentation tool, um, critical thinking in the text, National Geographic images. Every lesson is three pages. That is great. You need that extra support. Um, it's better to learn one thing well than a whole bunch of things. If I had 12 units and I had 10 lessons in each unit, they're going to be learning cursory things. Instead, I want to have five lessons per unit, and I want to have eight units. That way, the students um, are learning what is most important. Anytime you want to talk about acceleration, this is a, a conversation we can have about what's most important and what we should be teaching. Um, integrated skills. They're integrated within the lessons, including pronunciation and grammar. Uh, you, we've talked about the videos. We didn't talk about the review pages, but there's three pages of review. And uh, you have the reading challenge. You also have the lesson planners, which are a must. Please, please, please get the lesson planner. Ask your rep about the lesson planners. Get those lesson planners so that you have, you when you're asking about what I think, you'll see it in the book. You don't have to follow it 100%, but it'll give you a lot of good ideas. If you're a seasoned teacher and you want to, uh, you want additional information or just a place to start, that's where to go. The activity bank worksheets, around 2,000 for the entire series. There's, um, uh, there's around 500 or so per level. Is that right? No. There's 400 or 300 or so per, per level. Um, you've got your online workbooks and then the National Geographic videos. So, that's it for my presentation. It looks like it was exactly an hour. I can take a few questions if we can go a little uh, longer. Dahlia, I'm not sure, but I'm happy to uh, answer a couple questions. I can stick around for a few minutes. Yes, absolutely. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, type your question on the chat room. We'll just give a minute to type any questions. Is it possible to combine the second edition books and the third edition presentation tool? Well, the presentation tool is specific to book three. So really, the second edition, um, it won't look the same. The pages are different. We've added a lot of pages. So there are occasions when there are similar pages in the second edition um, to the third edition. And uh, you might be able to maybe 60% of the time or 75% of the time, maybe not page by page number, but by content, you might be able to do that. But it would be a little challenging. We have a question from Judy. Have you considered offering a pre-literacy edition? Uh, yes, we, we talked about that a lot. Um, I, this is one of my pet uh, projects here at work at Santa Ana College, or I shouldn't say project, concerns. We don't really meet the needs of our literacy students. And, uh, and I think that we could do that, and that's something for the future. We've talked about it before. Um, but one of the concepts that I think is important about literacy is that you really can't teach that in one semester. Literacy is something that will follow, uh, literacy issues are, is something that will follow the students for probably at least, uh, you know, probably the first three books at least, so basic book one and book two. So one of the thoughts that we've had, and we're not doing this, and I'm not promising anything. But uh, one of the thoughts I had is to have literacy workbooks that go along with the student book so that the students have an additional piece, an additional booklet that they can use to practice or book, that they can use to practice idea. Okay, other questions? Um, a question from Terry. Some schools in our region don't have access to internet technology. How much will they be missing? Um, well, there's a great amount, a, a rich amount of uh, materials that are online. Um, but you, every, you can do everything without any online. So you can, the book itself has the content that you need. So that's number one. 
Um, they just won't be getting digital literacy skills. The workbook, uh, the student workbook is paper. So if you only did the book and the student workbook, you'd be doing great. You wouldn't be able to do the video. Well, you could do the video. If you had a um, DVD player and a projection, you could do the video. You have the audio. You can get a CD for the audio, a DVD for the video. We have all of that. So you can have all of those things. Uh, so the, the, what you'd really be missing is the online workbook and uh, some of the accessibility of audio and video that makes it easier. But you could do it with a DVD and a CD. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so okay. much, everyone. Thank you, Rob, for facilitating this workshop. You have um, access to, to Rob via email if you want to send him any questions that you might have for future reference. We posted his email address on the, on the screen right now, so please make sure that you write that down. And certainly, if you need any materials, you can always contact your local rep. Um, we will also be sending a follow-up follow email next week, and that will, that will have the PowerPoint presentation, and the recording, and also a certificate of attendance. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk soon. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.